Good morning. Welcome to God's house on this, the fifth Sunday in Lent. We'd like to welcome everyone here in our sanctuary, as well as everyone who is worshiping with us around the world by means of the internet. Our order of service for this morning will follow the common service with Lord's Supper. Everything is available for you on the screens. We're getting closer. We're getting that much closer to finding our Lord and Savior completing the work He came here to do on the cross. And today we find Him in the garden. And it's a prayer that takes place, a prayer, this conflict between Jesus as both God and man and His prayer to His Father in heaven and all that He is about to go through. And we find His anguish and we recognize He went through all of this to carry out His Father's plan and that benefit belongs to you and me. May the Lord so bless our worship. We begin with our opening hymn. Those who are able, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death we may receive the forgiveness of sins and inherit eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson for this, the fifth Sunday in Lent, is recorded in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning at verse 31. And here we are reminded that God gave his people everything, and yet they threw it all away. So what did God do? He established a new covenant by forgiving their sins and remembering them no more. And now in these remaining days of Jesus' passion, may, <coughs> excuse me, may we embrace this new covenant. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, even though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is the word of our Lord. We join to sing our psalm of the day. Our second lesson for today is found in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 7. And here we are reminded of Jesus' patience and his humiliation as he became the perfect Savior. And it's to us the joy that Jesus expresses in our next lesson and the anguish that is evidenced in this one. It doesn't seem to make sense, but they do. And the end result is our salvation. A reading from Hebrews 5. 
During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Out of reverence for the words of Christ, please stand for the gospel. Our gospel lesson is found in John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20. In our gospel lesson, Jesus sees his glory as beginning with his ultimate humiliation. He has come to suffer. He has come to die. As horrible as, horrible as that will be, he looks forward to what his death will accomplish. A reading from John 12. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us join now to confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Our service continues with the singing of our next hymn.
We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. Amen. Listen to the word of God recorded in our second lesson for today in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. The writer to the Hebrews says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of our God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who became our great substitute as he went to the cross in our place, dear friends. This past week, I have to tell you, I had a bad day, or at least I, I thought at the time that it was a bad day. On Sunday, my wife and I traveled to Madison to to get a chance to see our newest grandson. That was a good day. We held the baby. We took some time to play with his older brother and sister. We read books with the grandchildren. We, we visited with their parents. And we had an overall great day. We talked and we relaxed and we ate together. But later in the day, the two older grandchildren began to feel a little bit sick. First it was a complaint of a headache, then some chills. There was a fever and there were some aches and it was clear that they were coming down with something. So we went home and we wondered if we were going to be okay ourselves. Then it hit. Tuesday night I began to feel a little bit lightheaded myself. I had a little headache and it continued into Wednesday morning. I didn't have much of an appetite and I just didn't feel quite right. I wasn't really sick, but I have to say I was still having a bad day. At least in my own mind I was. And then I got a message on my phone. I checked it and there, were, there was a series of photos from my son. The grandchildren had come down with the dreaded hand, foot, and mouth disease, covered with a rash and sores on their lips, in their mouths, on their legs, and their backsides. And I'm not even going to show you some of the body parts that were affected by this. I thought I was having a bad day until I realized that maybe my bad day wasn't so bad after all. Somebody has it a lot worse than I do. You know, I'm a little bit like that, and, and maybe you are too. I'm thinking I'm having a bad day when I wake up and my back hurts until I realize that there are some people who can't get out of bed unless somebody helps them. I think I'm having a bad day when it snows and I have to get out the snowblower to clear out the driveway until I realize that there are people who don't have a snowblower or a garage or a driveway or maybe even a house that is able to keep them warm in the days when it really gets cold. This side of heaven, we, we do that, right? We have a lot of bad days, at least in our minds, but how bad are those days? really. The Lord helps us through. Today, the writer to the Hebrews introduces us to someone who had a truly bad day. It was all part of our Savior's mission as our great Messiah, our great high priest. Even on the worst of days, we learn he's teaching us He's teaching us a powerful lesson on prayer and a powerful lesson on obedience. And we find today as we read through the letter of Hebrews that this is the Savior we need, the one whom the writer calls Jesus, our perfect high priest. The letter to the Hebrews is a bit of a mystery. We don't know who the author was. He doesn't name himself, but we do know that he's writing to a group of people who were having a lot of bad days. They'd been raised in Jerusalem, in Judaism, excuse me, and they were pleased to know 
that Jesus Christ was their Savior. They accepted him as their Lord. It was a joy and relief to be freed from the rituals and the restrictions of their old Jewish way of life. They lived in the freedom of God's promises, and they were pleased to know God's forgiveness. But there were still a lot of Jews who rejected Christianity, and these new Christians now were facing severe persecution, not only from the Jews, but also from the Romans, and they were under pressure to deny their faith. They needed to be reassured that the Christianity that they had accepted was true, that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the Old Testament prophets, had foretold. So the author of the, Hebrew, the letter to the Hebrews addresses their concerns. He makes the point again and again that Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than Moses himself. He's better than Aaron or better than any high priest. He writes, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. What he's saying is, think back to the days when Jesus was here among us. He's like a priest, only better. Any priest knows the flaws and the failings of the people that he serves, but Jesus understands our flaws, our feelings, our sins perfectly. He's true God, but he's also truly human. He was tempted in every way just as we are. He had his enemies. He faced grief and loss. He struggled with the problems and the trials of life. Don't think it was easy. It wasn't just because he was God. He took on our human nature, and it was real. There might be no greater illustration of his human nature than the night that he was betrayed, the night that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. That was the night his disciples were a huge disappointment, the night he prayed fervently for us while they slept. It all began innocently enough, a dinner among friends in an upper room. Even before the meal began, his friends got into an argument over which of them was the greatest. And during the meal, there was a tense exchange over which of them would be the one to betray him. But afterward, Jesus experienced a time of great, great anguish in prayer. As he knelt in the dark shadows of the olive trees in Gethsemane, Jesus knew what lay ahead of him. His enemies would soon come to arrest him, the night would degenerate into a series of fake trials, and predetermined outcomes. Throughout the night, he would endure the hatred of his enemies. He'd suffer beatings and abuse, treachery and torture, and shame and death. But there in the garden, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. In agony, he cried out, to his heavenly father and his prayers to his heavenly father that night were intense as we think about that night in the garden it's a good place for us to pause and to ask ourselves a question how's your prayer life if we're honest it's not what it ought to be it can go off the rails in one of two directions. It's a problem if we reserve our, our prayer life largely for Sunday mornings or just before meals, and we don't do much besides that. The Bible tells us to pray continually, but so often we don't. Maybe we imagine, right, that we can handle life on our own, that it's something that we can do all ourselves. We don't want to have to come to God in prayer, or maybe we think that our prayers don't do that much good, so what's the use? And so we pray pretty much only when we have something to complain about, and not much more. If that's our prayer life, that's a problem. Or maybe we do pray a little bit more consistently. We we know the Lord's Prayer, we know the meal prayers, and maybe a few, other, a few other prayers besides. In fact, we know them so well 
that we don't really have to think about them when we say them anymore. Listen, Jesus says, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words, mindless prayers. That's another problem, right? And our problematic prayer life recognizes just one reason why Jesus struggled so greatly in the garden that night. He suffered for our sins. He suffered for our failings. And his suffering had already begun. The weight of the world's sin was pressing down upon him. He prayed to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard. He was hurt to the request that he not have to go through with the suffering that he would about, was about to suffer that request was heard. His father gave to him a loving no. But he sent an angel to strengthen Jesus to make it through the difficult time that he was about to suffer. Jesus knew that he was going to have to go to the cross. He couldn't avoid it. He understood why. He knew he was doing it, and he was doing it for us. He went there to suffer for us, to bear the curse of our sin take his father's wrath in our place. And that's what he did. He loved us that much. And at the conclusion of his agonizing prayer that night, he rose from his prayer to meet those who would soon arrest him, and torture him. When he did that, he did it for you, and he did it for me. Even on the worst of days, Jesus, our great high priest, teaches us a lesson on prayer. And he teaches us how to obey. We read on, the son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. As we take a look at the scriptures here, we recognize that Jesus did perfectly obey his heavenly father and his will. And the proof of his obedience in scripture is overwhelming. For hours, the, the Sanhedrin, who put Jesus on trial, the Jewish ruling council, they struggled to come up with some kind of charge to, to bring against Jesus. They wanted to find some kind of way to put him to death, but they couldn't find anything. Pilate said more than once that he found no basis for a charge against him, no reason to put this man to death. Even the thief on the cross, recognized that this man, Jesus, had done nothing wrong. He was fully obedient, obedient to his father for his entire life. It's mind-boggling. And all that was left for Jesus, the Son of God, was to bring his, his obedience to his father's plan, to its fulfillment, to its completion, so that he would suffer and die for the sins of the world. So we have our bad days we struggle with illness and depression. We struggle with death and disease. We have broken bones, and broken hearts. We have strained relationships and troubled homes. Some of what we suffer is imposed on us by others. A good deal of what we suffer we bring upon ourselves. Some of it's nobody's fault, and yet the Lord still permits it to come into our lives for a blessing. It's not easy to be a Christian in today's world. It's not easy to live our lives as a Christian. And like those first century Christians, we may at times be tempted to give in, to compromise a little bit, to make things easier on ourselves so that we don't have to go through suffering for our faith as Jesus our Savior did. For times like that, what are we going to do? How do you handle the bad days of your life. Learn from Jesus here. Even in the worst of days, he's teaching you something here. Keep your eyes and ears open to the lessons that Jesus wants you to learn. When you're treated unfairly, remember Jesus was too. When God allows pain or illness 
to linger. Remember that this world is not your home. Your Lord has prepared a far better place for you. When friends or family or people at work turn their backs on you and make life difficult for you, largely because you're a Christian and are desiring simply of living a Christian life, lean on Jesus Christ and come to your heavenly Father in prayer as he did. He hears those prayers and he answers them. He's your refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And he'll be there for you. And when it seems as if you're seriously failing in God's school of suffering, remember Jesus, your high priest, because his perfect obedience in your place covers all your failings. And as we read, once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Let this Savior meet you in your suffering and find peace and forgiveness in his cross. We're going to have our bad days. We're going to fail at times in our prayer life. We're going to fail to submit completely and entirely to God and his will. Our faith is going to falter. But that's why Jesus prayed in Gethsemane with such great anguish. He prayed for you. That's why I went to the cross. He went there for you. And that's why he is your great high priest. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Those who are able, please stand for prayer. In our intercessory prayers for this morning, we offer a prayer on behalf of Carrie Geiger, daughter of Ellen Coster, who has been hospitalized, for Steve Wardell, who is also hospitalized, for David Schneider, who is recovering from surgery, and for Lane Stephen Schultz, newborn son of Dan and Olivia Schultz. 
we go before God. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have removed the guilt of our sins and washed us clean in your own blood shed on the cross. We struggle here in a world infected by sin. We have good days and we have bad days. As we daily face challenges to our faith, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to accept the difficulties we face and to gladly and willingly obey your Heavenly Father's will. Remind us, Lord, that since you lived here in this world, you know and understand the difficulties we face. Though you are God, you humbled yourself to become like us. And though it was difficult, you obeyed your Father's will and followed his plan for the salvation of the world. You went to the cross, you suffered and died, you did it for us, you did it in love. How can we thank you for all you have done? Lord, we pray today for those in need of your comfort and strength. Look with mercy on Carrie Geiger and Stephen Wardell in their illness and be with Dave Schneider as he recovers from his surgery. Bless them and give them a special measure of patience for the long road ahead. Lead them to thank you for all the blessings you have given them and for all those you promised to give. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of a child, Lane Stephen, that you have given to Dan and Olivia Schultz. Keep them in safely in your care and grant health to both mother and child. We pray that you make him a blessing and source of joy to his parents and to many others. Hear us, O Jesus, in whose name we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue now at the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, All of you drink of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Oh, God the Father, source of all goodness, in Your loving kindness You sent Your Son to share our humanity. We thank You that through Him You have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that You will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by Your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve You day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
Good morning to one and all. We'd like to thank you for joining us for worship today. We have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we have received an answer to the call for principle. Dear fellow believers, after prayerful consideration and deliberation, I have decided to remain at Trinity in Bay City and continue to serve our Lord there. Thank you for the fellowship we enjoyed as I spoke with your teachers and leaders about the needs at Trinity Lutheran School. I especially appreciated the many contacts I had through phone, email, and text message. It is my prayer that our Lord will send someone to serve you soon. May the Lord bless you as we all continue to serve in his kingdom. In his service, Mr. Hafner and family. So Mr. Hafner has returned our call to serve as principal, and so we will go before our district president and the Commission on Lutheran Schools and request another call list to be as soon as we can. It will take at least two weeks to be able to get that call list and we'll go about this yet again. So we thank Mr. Hafner for prayerfully considering our call. Also, uh, let's see, we got another call meeting dropping down just a little bit. We will have another call meeting on this coming Sunday, on uh, the 24th, following our second service and that call meeting will be for a third grade teacher. So please keep that in mind. We have our Wednesday midweek services, Lenten services, at 3.30 and 6.30 p.m. again this week. And then Saturday, we have Parents' Night Out. If you haven't heard about this, this is one of the efforts that our 7th and 8th graders are performing for. Uh, if you'd like to have a night out and you want to bring, you need babysitters, then just bring your kids here. Our young people will watch them. And then you have a night out, or we also have an event going on for those under the age, I think it's 40, 45, so any of you old people, you don't count. So they're gonna, there is a get-together that will take place at the mill. Uh, I believe it, think, it begins at like 6 o'clock, and it's an opportunity to hear about our congregation, but also really to listen and hear what you have to say, so please make use of that. And then Easter for Kids is set up for on Sunday, the 24th, from 4 to 6 p.m. And then also an Easter Lily donation sign up in the hallway. I think that's everything. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Have a great week.